Hello everyone. Good Hello. Goedemorgen. Goedemorgen allemaal. Hey Huub, je bent de allereerste. Goedemorgen. Good morning, en Axel is er ook. Goedemorgen. Salama Pagi, everyone's checking in again. It's nice to see everyone again. Yvonne, good morning. I loved your um, safe bell. Hey, we it's, have somebody from Korea. Hello. Hello. Who no, are you? Are? Thailand. No, that is that is not from Korea. That is from The Hague. From where? Ha, Den Haag. Den Haag. Den Haag. Uh -huh. It's my youngest son. Oh. oh. <laughs> but the language is Korean or not? Yeah, yes, it is. Ah. Good morning, Catherine. And Paul and Yvonne are saying good morning and a comp our compliments for the nice uh, videos and interviews you made for the virtual Duikvaker dive show last week. We enjoyed it. Thank you, Paul. That's very nice. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Good morning, Albert. Solama Pagi. And Jennifer is here and Sip. Wow. Good morning, Congratulations everyone. Congratulations with all the snow and ice there in Holland. <laughs> Hello, Randy. Sulama Sore. <laughs> and Wim and Desiree. Graham, good evening. Yeah. Uh, Wim oh. Desiree, I read your message. It's okay. And yeah. Graham, I have to catch up on Stephen's sessions later. Apologies, but have a great session. Thank you, Graham. And good to have you here for as much as you can make it. Wedding anniversary. Congratulations. <laughs> Congrats. Nice. Um, Very congratulations, Graham. Keep Dagmar on being says, happy. Captivated Canadians, Dagmar and Philip. Hello. Good morning, Dagmar. Good morning, Philip. And Peter Borgman. Uh, Lekker hoor. <laughs> Jürgen. Hello, all together. Hello to you too. And you see. <laughs> wow, Peter. so many people here. Wow, that's a lot. I, uh, you yeah, must be I popular, Stephen. I am afraid all the seats are already taken, so the others will have to stand. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Anyway, uh, it seems you are popular, Stephen. Well, yeah. you you make the publicity, I don't. But you come up with the uh, always nice uh, subject. So uh, before we start, uh, we have an announcement regarding our live streams, Simone. Yes, um, guys. We enjoyed very much talking to you during the Duikvaker uh, in the Zoom meetings there. We met almost all of you on that Zoom meetings during the dive show. And that's why we thought it would be nice if, um, if you can do that more often or we can do that more often. So we have decided that we will alternate the presentations and the Zoom meetings. So this week we will have Stephen to give us a, a nice insight on the behavior of the underwater life. And next week we will have a Zoom party. And then we will do the Zoom party in two languages. So we will do two times 45 minutes. And we start with the Dutch one, was it? Yeah. Yep, yeah. yeah, we start with the Dutch one. Oh, no, we start oh, with the uh, English it's the other one. way around. We do the English one first so that the Canadians yes. and Americans yes. don't have to go to bed so late. Yes, so we start yeah. at 3 o'clock and we do yeah. the Zoom meeting in, uh, in English. And then at 4 o'clock and at our normal time, we will do the, another Zoom meeting in Dutch. So and let's, call them, let's call them parties because meetings is too informal. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, party, party time. So bring party your time. beer. Oh no, it's morning. Bring your cup of coffee and um, we'll make a party out of it. So that is what we plan to do. So next week, Zoom, yep. party time. Yep. And then so, what uh, is coming the week after, we don't know yet. Yeah, so uh, please keep an eye out for our newsletter. We'll also make the announcement on our, on our Facebook page, of course. Uh, we plan to send out our next newsletter on Tuesday. If you haven't subscribed yet, just go to our website, talasomanado.com, scroll all the way up to the bottom and just enter your email address in the box there um, because we have some uh, big announcements to make over the coming week. But that comes later. Uh, first of all, Stephen, thanks a lot for joining us again. Well, my pleasure, as you yeah. know, 
Yeah, yep. you, you, it seems you are becoming a bit of our resident marine biologist. That's what you wrote. I was a little bit surprised because I would love yeah, you to, didn't reside, know that. to reside in Manado right now. Yes. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's an unpaid job, Stephen, as far as long as you know that, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> True. So um, whenever you are ready, Stephen, um, well, are you? Just uh, pop in the first slide then, please. Are you? All right. Okay. Have fun, guys. It all, it all, I'm, I'm talking a little bit about my, uh, my life. Uh, my interest in the underwater world started very young, in freshwater though. Um, here I'm sampling a little stream in, uh, in France. I must be four or five years old. And that, that was the start of a career, if I may call it a career. Uh, the next step, um, Ariane, please. The next step was uh, hunting the underwater world. Uh, I don't know how many innocent animals I have killed, but that was my my, my first passion uh, on underwater life. But that changed, that changed. Um, and a few years later, Arjen, um, I had become a, a researcher, I have done uh, and marine research for about 12 years and I'm working here in the Mediterranean in southern France. The thing I'm holding in my hand is a contraption to measure currents. Uh, I measured many things uh, along with the underwater life, current, temperature, uh, light uh, and many other things. And so my, my interest had switched to science. And the next slide, uh, I am working in Puerto Rico and I am testing different methods of uh, making inventories of um, coral reefs. I compared the then existing methods, I think there were about seven or eight of them, uh, in order to decide and to help other researchers with deciding which is the, the best method. In so far, uh, how do you get the most accurate results in the limited amount of time that you have for uh, two dives? Um, unfortunately, the, the, the results were quite clear, but unfortunately, until now, nobody seems to have read that article that they wrote about it because people keep using different methods and not always the best ones. Well, and then in the, in the process of working underwater and being long time underwater, not moving very much, I became friends with some of the underwater creatures. Arjen? Yes. This is how I became friends with a grouper in the Mediterranean. And each time I went to my working spot, we said hello to each other. Uh, he was re he was really used to to my presence by then, and I worked uh, mainly on soft corals. And amongst the soft corals, my main interest was for gorgonians. And I have a slide there, and this is where I enter the subject of today. Um, the subject is not gorgonians. The subject is when you go underwater. First you go, first you are a diver. Okay, and then at one point you forget that you are diving because you are, have become such a good diver that it has become routine. You do the right things, but you do them routinely so you can focus on what is surrounding you. And okay, so you observe Gorgonians and you have all, I, I suppose all those who are watching now, you have all noticed that Gorgonians are fen-like, they are called sea fens, uh, that's, the, that's the other name, uh, they are flat, they, they grow in one plane. And now we come to, to the next step of diving, it is not only seeing things, and uh, here's a nice other example, it is not only seeing things, but it is trying to understand why is it that way. The first steps in underwater biology 
is gasping at, uh, at something, uh, thinking it is nice enough to take a picture of it, and then for some courageous ones to, uh, to try to find out what is the name of this animal, to which group belongs it, or is it a plant or an animal with a Gorgonian, you, you could even uh, question that. And the next step, and that is the real subject of today, is trying to understand. And Gorgonians grow in a flat plane because they grow uh, perpendicularly to the main current. That's the best way to catch as much plankton as possible. So just a simple observation. This Gorgonian is, is uh, filtering the seawater, and the best way to do that is, uh, is to have the, 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 the most current going through my branches. So that's why they grow that way. Not all filtering animals do that. Here we have the example of a soft coral, uh, an alcyonarian. Um, but it is a filterer. It means that it is filtering plankton with all these little polyps, with all the little uh, tentacles. And this is a nice example of a passive filterer. It, it, is, it is just waiting for the current to bring plankton particles to uh, its uh, feeding polyps. Now, I have brought on the subject of feeding. And eating is one of the most important things in life. I mean, if you don't eat, you die, right? And it brings along lots of things. If you, if you understand that each animal has to eat, plants don't have to eat, they make their food, but each animal has to eat. If you understand that, then you understand already a lot. Why do they have eyes? Why do they have claws? Why do they have teeth, etc., etc. And the other thing is, knowing that animals have to eat, it means that other animals are being eaten. And in order to survive, those have to be very careful and put everything in, 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 in what is possible to uh, not to be eaten. That is why they have needles, why they have a bad taste, why they have camouflage, why they dig into the sand. So eating and not being eaten is, is, is almost three quarters of all biology. Now, there are underwater, there are several ways of getting food. And we are in the passive filters, and there are other ones. Arjen, please. Um, you, you have the, the, the Christmas tree worm, you can see how, how fine these tentacles are. are they, they form a mesh into, into which uh, plankton particles get trapped. Same thing is true for crinoids or feather stars. Next. There too, if you go really, if you look really close, you can see these very fine, it's, it's almost like Velcro. And um, so here we have another passive filter and then we got we get active filter simone remember this dive you yes this basic place where you took me um these uh, goose barnacles they are active filters they also filter the plankton out of the seawater column but they do it with their hind legs these are crustaceans by the way but the topic of today is not, not saying the names or, or, or recognizing the groups. It is understanding what is happening. And if you look at these closely, uh, when they are alive or when they are in a movie, this unfortunately is just a picture, but I'll do the movie for you. They go with their hind legs out of their shell and they grab the plankton. All the time they make this movement. And, oh, by the way, Arya and you were there too. We were there all together. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. It wasn't that Very nice day. And a very, very big current. Yeah, yeah, the current was amazing. Uh, a little bit frightening, I must admit. <laughs> then the the, the ne next group of passive of active filters, sorry, uh, are the sponges. And here you can see I have shown this picture before in when I did my talk on sponges, but here you can see the seawater that has been pumped in by by tiny cells <laughs> like, like with flagelli. Uh, and the water is pumped through these veins that you can see, and the food is filtered out. 
And there is yet another group of passive filterers, the uh, C squirts or Sidians. There we go. Uh, Lovely they, photo. They suck in the, the seawater through the big opening and it comes out through the small one. And in between, all the food is being filtered uh, by the animal. So getting food by filtering. Um, a last one example of passive filter is, is the next one and maybe i can put out a guess what what is this for those who are looking on what well if you, uh, you, if, if you if wait, you wait about, about half a minute, 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 minute. okay so the question is 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 someone recognizing what kind of active filter you see here so this is not the eye of some fish. <laughs> is it an asshole? A Be what? Beg your pardon. <laughs> Excuse me. Is it an asshole? <laughs> well, I wouldn't call it that way. Uh, we have one guess. It, it almost looks like a gas burner. It, it, it is it is indeed, Paul and Yvonne, it is indeed a giant clam, even if you mistyped it, but the C and the V are very close together. So, yes, it is a giant clam. It is the uh, the, 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 the out-streaming siphon of a giant clam. Well done. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Good. Good. You get a cookie. <laughs> Good. So that's for the filters, the active, the passive and the active filters. So when you when you look at animals underwater, and since food and feeding and eating is such an important topic, try to, to see or to guess or to observe uh, what, what are they doing to get food. It is really rewarding to stop by and, and take some time and look. The, the flippers can wait. The eyes are more important. The mask is the most important part of your uh, diving equipment. Now we go to a, a next group. The grazers, those who graze the uh, the sea bottom, either for algae or for uh, small uh, invertebrate animals. So here's the detail. This is Lembe Street for sure. Uh, a detail of a sea urchin. Um, I in the next picture I have the detail of another sea urchin, Mediterranean Sea, uh, which I've turned upside down so that you can see. Uh, the lantern of Aristotle. Uh, it's uh, just a uh, second, just a second Stephen. Stephen. Yeah, yeah. Interrupt, interrupt. Yes. Simon, Simon. Can you use yeah, your headset? Yeah. yeah, well, I had a very big um, noise actually at Ego when I was using my headset, but I can try okay. again. E right. Echo seems to be the new topic. Okay. Okay, sorry, Stephen. Go ahead. Um, so, Sea urchins have five teeth underneath, and that is the, the, the organ with which they scrape the sea uh, bottom. It is worthwhile to, um, the adagio is never touch animals underwater well. And, and, and we must not exaggerate. Uh, you can pick up a sea urchin and turn it upside down, and when you have observed it and you are kind, you put it back uh, on the good side. It will do the sea urchin no harm, but pick the right species because you might do some harm to yourself if you don't. Yeah. For that, that's not a topic that we can talk about another time, maybe. Um, then there is another grazer that uh, Simone is very fond of, I know. It's a beauty. Oh, it's a real oh, beauty. I love those, really. Yes. <laughs> but aren't they, aren't they lovely? Well, so... It's not. It's not really a grazer. It's it's uh, it's it's a predator. Uh, it feeds on coral. It turns its uh, stomach uh, inside out, uh, digests the coral polyps, and then uh, takes it takes it all in. Um, and then, well, we are slowly moving from from via the grazers through this uh, this gorgeous. Uh, Kind of uh, starfish to the real predators. Here is one. Uh, oh. here, 
you 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 ha you have a cuttlefish uh, that just caught a crab. Um, wow! And well, you can see that it is very well equipped. It has its tentacles. It has its eyes. It must judge the direction, the distance, uh, in order to attack. So. When talking about feeding, we are talking about a, a, a lot of other things. Uh, we, we, I'll come back to that a little bit later. And then if you think of predators, then of course we are talking about sharks. Um, I, 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 like, I like this picture very much, especially with the other shark that, that disappears in the mist. Um, now, this picture, in 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 in, for my for my feeling, uh, shows what a predator is. It it is it is going for its prey. <laughs> the photographer in this example, no, <laughs> it it did not it did not have any bad intentions, I'm sure, but it was curious. It was sensing. It has many organs to to know what what is out there. And if needed, it uh, it will attack. Not so much divers, of course, but it will attack uh, prey that uh, that is needed for the predator to survive. Now, I already uh, brought up the subject. In order to be a predator, you need organs of sense, and eyes can play a very important role. Here is the cuttlefish again with his very. Uh, peculiar eye with a very strange shaped pupil. I always tend to, uh, I indulge in thinking that this is a W for my last name. Um, and there are, of course, many other eyes in the underworld, in the outer world. There's the octopus. Octopus, yes, octopus. Uh, very, very uh, strange eye too. It looks a little bit like the eye of a goat with a horizontal um, pupil. And there are even stranger eyes. Um, mm. Mantis. Um, mantis shrimp. Um, there are different kinds of mantis shrimp with different shaped eyes. This is the, 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 the strangest one as far as the shape goes. Uh, then there is a very beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, well, Herm. Um, there, there is there are these beautiful eyes of uh, I don't know what the mantis shrimp is called. What's the common name? The next mantis? one. Mantis. Mantis. No, the next one. This is the mantis shrimp. Yeah, yeah it yes. is a mantis shrimp, but doesn't it have a, a, an English name? Well, maybe. Never mind. Um, these eyes that can go in every direction separately uh, and each eye looks in three different directions you can see that there, on each eye or on the eye that you see on the right side of your screen you can see that there are three zones one one band in the middle and then two zones uh, north and south of that and uh, that eye looks in three different directions and the other eye which is aiming in another another way is also looking at three direct so it sees six images at a time i mean we are very proud of our binocular vision which allows us to to measure depth uh, and allows us to play tennis for instance and hit the ball uh, but these guys have hexa ocular vision they have an amazing vision uh peacock mantis thank you Hube. um they have an amazing vision which allows them to be very precise in direction and distance and to be very precise when they attack. And then there are the more familiar eyes and just a few, just for the beauty of them, some eyes of fish. They oh, wow. are very much like our eyes. They have a lens. No, no. Uh, stay, stay. Sorry? Is this a stingray? Stay, stay. No. Uh, no, no. Uh, the, 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 the naso, uh, what's their English name? Um, oh, come on, well, <laughs> later on. I'm not, I, I don't like later. to stumble. Later, well, later. I'm, sure, I'm sure that our uh, viewers will uh, hazard a guess. Yeah, yeah, they, they, they will tell, tell me, they will help me. Yeah. 
Um, uh, I, have, I have one more guess from uh, Wim and Dave today. They're saying it's a Tesla, but I don't know which picture they were referring to. <laughs> no, neither do I. <laughs> uh, yeah, Goop that's what I thought you. I thought also yeah. blue spotted stingray. No, no, it is. It is not. Well, let let me uh, look it up. Let me look it up. Okay. Um, because I know what it is, but I, I I don't know the English name. So I look in. I have a very good underwater field guide here. Naso. That's the English. That's the Latin name. Naso. Four eighty. It's coming. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Just uh, show the picture uh, to your camera as soon as you have it. And no, you're not alone in this world, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big nose unicorn fish. Ah. Wow. Okay. That one. All right. Yep. Um, then I have some more eyes. Next one, I know what it is, but everybody will know. That's a parrotfish, yeah. That's a parrotfish. And the next one. <laughs> Vim and Deise are saying that uh, the mantis shrimp, the peacock shrimp, is uh, the Tesla because it's ah. the one with, with three eyes in one eye. <laughs> ah, okay. Well, this is interesting. I wouldn't mm. know. Yes, you is do. Is this the a puffer people? fish? Puffer no, fish? The colors are very yeah. typical. The blue lines and the brown lines and brown dots. You know this one. Scribbled mm. file fish. Oh, yeah. And, oh, beautiful. Uh, and the next one is an easy one. Yeah, that's a lionfish. That's a lionfish. Now, yep. okay, so there's the beauty of these things. Uh, but then always remember these eyes are used to find prey or in other species to uh, evade predators. Now, when you see the danger coming, it's always better than when you don't see them coming. Now, there are other organs of sense that are very peculiar. Uh, I'm referring to the nudibranchs, which have rhinophores, you know, these antennae that they yeah. have on, on front of their head. But they are not antennae. When, when a biologist speaks of antennae, they speak of uh, feeling organ, organs, and these are smelling organs. These two things in front of a, of, of a nudibranch are its nose. Mm. That's oh, where wow. their smell is located. And that is why these organs have these lamellae to enhance the surface with the seawater so they can catch more molecules. And they, use, they have no eyes, so they use these rhinophores to find food, some rotting shellfish or whatever, or also they, they can be predators. They, uh, they, they go very often for either, they are very specific. Some, some species eat sponges, others eat uh, sea squares, ascidians, uh, others eat uh, bryozoans. So they, they are very specialized, which is a good way to avoid competition. If everybody goes for the same food, then we have competition. Um, so this is a nice way to, uh, to avoid competition. Each one is specific for some kinds of food only. You can observe this. Next time you see nudibranchs, notice somewhere up there in your, in your, in your memory, huh, this one I've seen on a sponge. And the next time you see them on a sponge, you uh, you will maybe notice that it, it is the same species of sponge. And the third dive, when you see such a sponge in the distance, you go for it because you know that very probably there are these kinds of nudibranchs on it. So you become, you become even smarter. <laughs> now, what happens when underwater creatures or land creatures for that, what, what happens when they are eating? I would like to show that. With the help, yes. Now, here's the shark again. And the shark is eating some uh, bigger fish, let's say groupers. This is, this is just for explaining something. It is not a, a, a realistic situation, maybe. But the principle is, is, is very true. So shark eats grouper. 
The grouper is smaller than the shark. Most of the time, a predator eats prey that are smaller. The grouper eats uh, butterfly fish. True or not is not important. The butterfly fish eats nudibranchs. The nudibranch grazes algae. The algae are very small. They are much smaller than, than shown in this picture as compared to the shark, of course. Anyway, now this is called a food chain because the food is being passed on, and that is what the arrows show, it's being passed on from one stage to the next. So it starts with the algae, which are called P in this, uh, in this diagram. P is for producer. They produce food. They produce organic matter. That is what photosynthesis is for. That's what all the plants and algae do. Um, then when these algae are being uh, eaten by the nudibranch, the nudibranch becomes a consumer. It's a, it's a consumer of the first degree. It's a, it's a vegetarian. Um, it eats only plant matter. Then we get several C2s. They are all uh, carnivores. So C1 is herbivore, C2 is carnivore. But then you have the first carnivore, C21, butterfly fish, which is being eaten next by the grouper, C22, which is being eaten by the, by the shark, C23. Now, just in order to understand the, 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 the next big step, there are two big steps. The first is that you must understand that all the food that one eats, whether it is you or whether it's the shark or whether it's the nudibranch, all the food does not stay uh, as a mass in, 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 in the body of, of the, the one who is eating. Roughly speaking, you can say that a human being eats about one kilogram per day. I'm saying roughly, I'm, I'm thinking in steps of 10. It is much more than 100 grams and it's much less than 10 kilograms. So let's say it's about one kilogram. And let's say roughly speaking too, that a day, uh, a year has 400 days. That means that in one year you eat 400 kilograms of food, okay? Um, you need about 20 years to be full grown. 20 years, 400 kilograms per year, that's 8,000 kilograms of food. Now, if you are a solid guy, you weigh 80 kilograms at the end. That means that out of 8,000 kilograms of food, you have only made 80 kilograms of body weight. That's 1%. Well, what happened to the 99 other percent? Well, one big heap of shit, of course, but most of it has been used for energy. You need energy to keep your body heat. Uh, you need energy to move. You need energy to renew your cells, etc., etc., etc. Living costs a lot of energy. That's why we need all that food. That's why we need eyes, rhinophores, teeth, etc., etc. Um, now, in nature, where most animals grow much faster, they don't need 20 years to, to be adult, the, the yield is more than 1%. It is roughly speaking, it depends on many things, but roughly speaking, it's 10%. So that is why I say, now we go back to the diagram, that to get one diagram, one gram, sorry, of shark, well, the shark must have eaten 10 grams of grouper, which in turn must have eaten 100 grams of butterfly fish, which has eaten one kilogram of nudibranchs and 10 kilograms of uh, algae were necessary for one gram of shark. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Let me just stop you uh, for a second, Stephen. I just want to go through a couple of. Uh, I get comments. carried away. Stop me. Yes. No, 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 no. That's all right. Um, I was uh, captivated. Uh, so Hoop is saying he's waiting for the eye of the crocodile fish. Well. Well, uh, I have it, but not in this show. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Hoop. And uh, Petra was asking the yellow and blue. Is that not a file fish? Yes, that's what you said, the no, Stephen? One. Yeah. It's a file fish. If I uh, yeah. go back. This one? No, the, that, 
That is yes, a file that fish. one. Yeah. Scribbled, a... scribbled file fish. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> let's see, Tinka is, has a lot of smileys. Uh, Chang Li has a lot of okay. Thank you, Chang Li. Chang Li. And uh, Vim and Desire are um, explaining why they call the peacock mantis shrimp uh, a Tesla because the Tesla apparently has a lot of cameras all around. So the car can see in all directions. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> But thanks okay. for the uh, for the explanation. Thank you for the information. <laughs> All right, that's uh, the comment so far, Stephen. The floor is yours. Yeah. Okay. So we can we can go to the next one. Yeah. It it shows what I have just been uh, telling. It's in French. I'm sorry, guys. It shows what uh, what I've just been talking. You need a huge amount of algae to get a smaller amount of nudibranchs, to get a very small amount of uh, sharks on top. This is called a food pyramid. It is not a food chain, it is the food pyramid. Now, the first, the first notion being that predators, uh, that all animals need lots of food, much more than they weigh themselves, now comes the next conclusion. This is why when diving in Manado or wherever, you will see much less sharks than algae. Yeah. Okay? Because one shark weighing, let's say, 50 kilograms, well, that is 50,000 grams, that is 50,000 times 10,000 grams of algae, that is 500 tons of algae. That is, you need enough underwater reef or, or world to have enough algae to feed the nudibranchs, the, 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 the butterfly fish, the groupers, to get one shark. That is why sharks are seldom. That is why when you go on, on, uh, on safari in Kenya, you will see much less lions than you will see uh, zebras, because it's one step further. Yeah. OK, so this is, this is something that, that one must understand. And and this is also why some animals are, are much 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 rarer than others, some types of animals, depending on where in the food chain and where therefore in the food pyramid they are. Um, we can go to the next slide, which which will please very much Simone, of course, this is her, her yes. sponge garden. Um, when you when you are underwater, you can observe, I am not going to use the word yet, you can observe many organisms of the same species together. I mean, here you can look, it's sponges, 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 as far as uh, the camera can look. There's another picture, the next one. It shows something similar except that it is not sponges, it is sea pens, soft okay. corals. Uh, you made this one in Likupang, didn't you? Yes, in the yes. north, eh? yeah? Yeah. Right. Mm -mm. Um, yeah, I try to use as man, much as possible pictures from Manado, but sometimes I, I go back mm. to, to others in order to explain. Um, this, what you, what you see here, is called a population. A population is many individuals of the same species together. But it's all the same species. I have some more examples of that. Oh, yeah. Here you have a population of tube worms. This is near the wreck, I yeah. think. Uh, and the next one, you have a population of sea urchins. Sea urchins. This, this was. This picture was taken in Bali, but never mind. They look now, very floppy. And there were literally tens of thousands of those. It was oh, incredible. Wow. A, a, a square kilometer of just this. And they, they are pretty small. They are, they are this size. Um, so a population, I, I repeat, a population is many individuals of one species together. <laughs> But that is not the real world. The real world is that many species live together somehow. Next slide. Now, here you can recognize the algae on top. 
A and the nudibranchs K and the butterfly fish N and the uh, grouper O. I'm missing the arrow that goes. <laughs> I see that now. That goes from the butterfly fish to the grouper. Never mind. And the shark P. But there are other food chains. There is the food chain of plankton, for instance. You have C and D. They are uh, uh, phytoplankton, that is uh, plant plankton, and D is zooplankton, that is animal plankton. And they are being eaten by a lot of species. We have seen the filters before. So. They are eaten by the sponges, they are eaten by the gorgonians, they are eaten by the coral, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And all these food chains, they, they intermingle. This is what we call a food web. And wherever you dive, most of the time, especially when you are on a reef, you have in front of your eyes, you have a food web. It's almost everything is somehow interconnected with everybody, which is... Also, why when one species uh, disappears, it has a, a large impact also on other species. Um, so, food web. Now, let's look at some food webs. You go to Banka, you dive on Banka, what do you see? A food web. I mean, all, all these corals uh feather stars sponges the fish in the background uh and the, the soft corals it's all interconnected and here you have passive filters you have active filter feeders you have predators um so next time you 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 look through your glass of your mask be aware that you are looking at a food web and that everybody is eating and everybody is trying not to be eaten. That's what is going on. I have some more. Two more, actually. Um, this, this is uh, very shallow at Bunaken. Uh, what do we have here? A food web. That's a food web. And the next one. This is... So, we... What, what we when we we have a population many many animals of the same species together and you don't really see the other ones but they are there and then you have the, what we call a biocenosis that is what i call a food web uh, that is all these species different species living together this is a very special biocenosis here we are deep into an underwater cave so no more daylight almost and well the life is not very spectacular but it is there and you can stumble upon some rare species that live only in the dark bless you simon um now we have gone from uh some species filterers passive active grazers filled uh predators we have slowly gone to the food chains and to the populations and to the biocenosis food webs now let's go back to the smaller things that you can see when you are diving very common sea star and okay when you have seen one blue sea star you've seen them all right well <laughs> maybe not if you look a little bit closer on the skin of the sea urchin are a very tiny little shrimp and they have the same color as the sea urchin why not to be eaten of course perfect hiding place um you're welcome see um and then if you turn the sea star around, and yes, it's okay to turn a sea star around. Uh, don't do it with your teeth. Do it softly with your fingers. Then you can find something else. Its Latin name is Tica. And it looks like a bivalve shell, you know, like a clam, but it is not. It's a snail. It's a snail, but it has forgotten to spiral. Mm -hmm. Now, this one uh, is a parasite. 
it's eating the the sea star poor thing and well here you have something that you can look for when you go for the smaller things so with your white angle mask you can see the biocenosis and with your macro mask you can see tika eating a sea urchin so these these this, this little shrimp and the 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 snail and the sea star they are living together not that it is the choice of everybody so the the shrimp is very happy to live on the skin of the sea star it's very happy because it's a nice hiding place most of the time they live underneath by the way uh and then uh the sea star doesn't doesn't care because the shrimp does no harm then there is of course this parasite you can see that it's it is doing ugly things to uh to the sea star well that's life you 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 don't always get presents but living together it's called symbiosis symbiosis literally means together living i have some other examples some well known of most divers and some maybe a little bit less this is a well known one of course um well what to say most fish, if they get between the tentacles of, uh, of a sea anemone, well, that's the last thing they see before they disappear from this world. But clownfish, anemone fish, they are able to live between these tentacles. Perfect hiding place. Who is going to follow them between those uh, uh, nettling tentacles that, uh, that, that, that give a very burning sense to most others that are dangerous for some? So, a uh, good hiding place for the, for the fish. And have you ever approached a sea anemone with clownfish in it? Then we will have noticed that the clownfish, they are protecting their territory. They are very territorial. They sometimes have their eggs uh, laid just beneath the anemone. So, they don't want intruders. And so, they protect in their way. They protect the anemone. This is a perfect symbiosis. Everybody happy. Next one. Here we have a, a hermit crab living in a shell. And on the shell, it has sea anemones. Well, the sea anemones didn't come there on their own. It was the, the hermit crab that first looked for a shell as a, as a, as a living space, as a house, to protect its, its behind, because its behind is not protected by shell. Uh, and then it has uh, sought out these anemones and has put them on its shell because it gives the, the crab a very nice protection to have these, uh, these, these, these dangerous sea anemones surrounding him. And if you look very closely, at, I, don't, I don't have the picture here, but if you look very closely at any crustacean, any lobster spiny lobster crab uh shrimp it has antennae uh that on the picture you can see them it's the the, the antennae are those two big ones whoops i must go to the other side like like this so you have in the picture you have these horizontal very long antennae that's for feeling but then between the eyes you have two little antennae sticking up they are like the rhinophores of the uh of, of, of the snails, of the, of the nudie branks, they are an organ of smell and they move all the time. When you look at the, at the crustaceans from close up, you can see these antennae moving, 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 and they are, they are taking in the, the molecules of scents that are in the seawater. And they are very good at that. And they, they, when they sense, hmm, there is a dead fish somewhere, they go for it. And they go for it and they eat. Now, have you ever seen a uh, hermit crab eating? If you haven't, that is because you didn't take enough time. It <laughs> is worthwhile looking at a hermit crab eating because when it eats, it, uh, it does not have very good uh, table manners, you know. And so there are little particles of food going everywhere. And then there are the anemone. They say, oh, little particles of food. They are happy too. So this is also a perfect symbiosis where both share. Um, there's another funny one that not everybody has seen, I'm sure. It's the next one. It's the boxer crab. The boxer crab also collects sea anemones. 
Um, and it's almost the same symbiosis as the one before, because uh, the anemones protect the, the crab, uh, and when a predator tries to get close to the boxer crab, the boxer crab, try to get me, try to get me. I have these burning, burning claws, you know. <laughs> uh, so it's, this is a nice protection to have boxing gloves that are, are even burning. Uh, and of course, the crab takes the aluminies from one meal to the other. It's like a very aggressive cheerleader. Yes. Well, they are called, they are called pom pom uh, crabs as yeah. well. Yeah, they are called that way. Um, then there's the next one. Oh, this is a nice one. I love that one. Uh, mm. These 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 are uh, uh, emperor shrimp, and emperor shrimp are quite lazy. So they hitchhike on the back of, uh, of, of, of a nudibranch. Sometimes they, they hitchhike on the back of a sea, sea cucumber. That doesn't take them very far, uh, but it gives protection. And I have, I have been observing this, uh, this lot for about 10 minutes or 15 minutes. I've, I've been uh, looking what went on. And here goes your snail slowly over the sea bottom. And these two shrimp, they hang from the balcony, and <laughs> whenever something nice comes by, they pick it. So <laughs> they they are they are really carried to to their food. It's I don't know if the uh, of the nudibranch has any advantage from this symbiosis, but there you go. And then there is the next one, which is very funny too. Oh yeah. So here we have a trumpet fish, and. Wherever the emperor fish is going, uh, the uh, the trumpet fish swims with it. It does the same. The tr trumpet fish does the same with uh, with sea turtles, with other species of fish. But uh, the, it swims exactly at the same speed, at, always at the same place. So it is. It, it has become very unobtrusive. You can't see that your predator is approaching because. The emperor fish goes for the coral or for sponges, depending on the species. But the trumpet fish goes for very tiny uh, crustaceans, and they don't see the danger coming. Uh, it's it's well hidden uh, between uh, behind the the bigger fish. And then we get to uh, a well known behavior: cleaning behavior. Um, you have a cleaner ras here who is who just went into the the gill hole of uh, of a moray eel and it's cleaning and if the the moray next eel next slide here yeah, are you next slide no no, no? i think no, you're no, not no, right. we're fine um, if the if 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 fish don't get cleaned either by cleaner fish or by by cleaner shrimps uh, they get sick very soon. So this is very important for their hygiene. And the cleaner animals, well, they get free food. They get the little parasites that are living in the mouth, the little uh, oh, bits no. of food, scraps of food that, that remain there. And uh, But it's, I mean, this picture, it was spectacular to see with what speed that uh, that cleaner fish went into, uh, into the moray eel. No. It really thrust itself in. Next one, cleaner shrimp. Well, mm. you saw this one two weeks ago. Um, this uh, this is the same behavior, cleaning behavior, getting getting rid of uh, old scales, getting rid of scraps of food, getting rid of parasites. You need the cleaner shrimp for that. And I have another example. There you go. And then we can move on to a next symbiosis. Oh, yeah. I love those. Yes, they are. They are cute, aren't they? Um, so we have we have the goby and we have the they are called the shrimp goby because they live together with the shrimp and you have the goby shrimp because they live together with the goby. Uh, these two live together. And it's it's a very strange thing. These two species, what are they doing together in the same hole? Well, 
if you watch a little bit patiently, you will see that uh, there is very distinct uh, distribution of different roles. Look at the fish first. The fish, like all fish, have a very keen eye. So the fish is watching. It's watching whether there is danger approaching. And if danger approaches, the fish will hide into its hole. The shrimp, look at the shrimp eye, this little white dot there. The shrimp is almost blind. Uh, so the shrimp doesn't see any danger coming. But then look at the one antenna of the shrimp that is touching the goby. So as soon as the goby makes a fast movement, it's also a warning for the shrimp and they go both into their hiding place. Oh, they're holding hands. They're holding hands, exactly. <laughs> Thank oh. you for that comparison. It's a very nice comparison. And uh, now, okay, so the, the shrimp takes advantage of the good eyes of the goby, but he has to work for that. And he's the bulldozer. He is keeping the house clean. And permanently sand and gravel is seeping into the hole, and which is, which is annoying because you have much have space for two. So the, the shrimp will be busy all the time bulldozing the, 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 the sand and the gravel out of the hole. I have another one of the same symbiosis, but two different species, but it's the same principle. Nice one. And so they are always in contact with each other. Now, the last way of living together, it's not what you want, really, for yourself. Oh, parasites. Parasites. Ooh. Yeah. Here we have a pair of sea lice living on the tail of a fish. Uh, they dig their claws into the flesh of the fish and they suck its blood. They mm. are like ticks on, 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 on your dog. Uh, but sometimes they are quite big for their, for their uh, blood supplier and it is not a nice way to live with, and it's not easy to swim with them either. So they are probably slowly killing the animal, that the fish that they are preying upon. Then there is another one. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Now, this isopod gets into the mouth of uh, an anemone anemone fish, sorry, uh, through its gills. It comes in from behind, okay. and with its claws, it 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 fixes itself upon the tongue of the uh, of the fish. It grows there, and it takes advantage of the food that the fish is taking in. But it also sucks the blood. And slowly, the tongue of the fish disappears. The tongue is totally disappearing, and only a, a little a stub of it remains in the mouth of the fish. This, this does not only uh, happen to clownfish, by the way. Oops. Oops. Yeah, we're having uh, problems with our Wi-Fi, Steve. Um, it, it happens to other fish as, as well, but the, uh, the isopod is becoming the tongue of the fish. It, it acts yeah. as the tongue because it's sitting on the, on the stub and, uh, well, it's there for life as long as the life of the fish lasts. Uh, Stephen, can I ask, how did the scientist ever found out that this animal gets in through the gills? I, sup I don't know, but what I would have done, and that's pro supposedly what, what they, 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 they have done as well, is you you catch a fish with 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 this uh, with this parasite on it, then you put it in an aquarium with another fish that has no parasite, and you watch and what, see hap what happens. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it has been observed in in in, in nature. Mm. Um, the last parasite for today. <laughs> Here you have the gill of a uh, of a nudibranch. But then there are these uh, purplish uh, things that are sticking out. It's almost <laughs> like an anemone. <laughs> yeah, but it is not. No, probably. They come, they come, 
they come in pairs. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are probably four pairs in there or more. Uh, these are the egg sacs of, uh, of um, not, iso not isopods. Yes, isopods as well. So these are crustaceans that are that are living as parasites on the gills, and oh, wow. that are reproducing there. And you can see the egg sacs uh, coming out. Wow! Now, when I took this picture, I didn't know. I didn't yeah. know what, what, what I was taking a picture of. So here we are back to the very first picture where I was with this little little fishing net in 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 a stream in France. Uh, I was curious. So, What's the, what's that pink color? What, what is it? Then I got closer. Hey, is it is it ill? What, what 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 is happening there? So I took the picture and then I went into literature and I found out what it was. <laughs> um, so curiosity I, I, curiosity must be the mo the motor of it of it all. You know you know I have a, a similar story with that. I was diving with Aris. Aris is one of the uh, former students of the school and he's now studying marine biology. Uh, at the university here, he's almost finished. And I was doing a dive with him here on the house reef and we found a bubble coral and I noticed brown spots on it. Uh, I've seen that more often, but never actually paid a lot of attention to it. See? And then I, I got my slate out and uh, I pointed to it and I wrote on the slate, sick with a question mark. And then Aris corrected me, uh, very light, rightfully so, and he said, no, they're flatworms. And then he showed me that they're actually moving. moving. This was amazing. Mm. Uh, I Honestly, I didn't know. And I've seen those brown spots many, Boy. many times, yeah. never knowing that they were flatworms. Hmm. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Before we uh, continue, just a couple of comments. Uh, Stephen? Yes, uh, the audience is Fendi is uh, saying hi. Hi, hello, Fendi. <laughs> and uh, Luke is saying, with divers, trumpet fish on your tank. Yep. <laughs> yes, yes. Can Sometimes, yeah. yeah. Can happen. And, uh, let's see. Chung Lee says that in Manado, we eat more fish than in Holland. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and then I've got a question for you from uh, Family van der Maas. Women, women Day today, they're asking if the... The goby and the crab, are, they are not born together. How do they find each other? And do they fight each other just like uh, 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 octopuses do over a shell? Well, I, I uh, oh, very good question. To start, a very good question. It's a goby with a G. Um, uh, because goby exists as well, and that's a fish. Um, I don't know how they find each other. That's That's... That's a question that you can ask very often. You on the on the fire uh, urchins, you have these uh, Coleman shrimp that live there together. How do the Coleman shrimp, which are very rare, how do they find their way to uh, to a sea urchin? I don't know. This is this is one of the mysteries of marine biology yeah. that still needs to be solved. Uh, but they will not fight because they need each other. So they are not fighting each other. Now, to... I think he means that are two gobies fighting over one shrimp. Ah. Oh I... yeah. No, I have seen. I, I have. Oh, I have seen one goby with two shrimps. I have seen two yeah. gobies with one shrimp. So as 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 long as everybody does their job, they seem to tolerate each other very well. Um, while we were talking, here are the whoops. The flatworms that you were referring to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I oh. never looked at them close by, but now I do. There, there, yeah. there, there it is on the on the bubble coral, which is quite common. But you can see yeah. find them on other organs as well, including yeah. the lowest picture, including the crown of thorn starfish. Mm -hmm. They have them too. Mm -mm. Probably, I think, a different species. Okay, we are getting to the last three slides. I don't know how am I with the time, uh, Arjen? That's okay, Stephen. Take your time. Um, when you see a coral, well, you know that, that it's a living organism. You know that it is growing. But, well, they don't move very fast, do they? So when you look at them, they, they are just dead things 
or, or immobile at least. No, they're not dead. Um, but when two corals grow and they, they come closer and closer to each other, and finally they touch each other, then you get something like what you see on this picture. And they are in competition here for space. They both want to become bigger. Uh, and you can see that the coral on the right is the more aggressive one. It is overgrowing the coral on the left. And more aggressive means that its nettle cells are a little bit more potent than the other species has. I have another example of that. Next picture. Yeah. <laughs> Here is a big coral trying to overgrow a smaller one, but the smaller one is the most aggressive one. It's the slower grower, but it's the more aggressive nettler. And so the bigger one grows around it, it will eventually uh, overgrow it totally, but you can see that the little one is uh, quite well defending itself. So even in corals that look so immobile, there is uh, there is dynamics to be observed. Uh, this is uh, David and Goliath, this picture. <laughs> the very last one. Um, here you have another competition for space. On the left, the purple thing, it's a sponge. And the sponge is overgrowing a coral and killing it. You yeah. can, you can Actually, see. we had something similar when we did the thing on sponges. Do you remember, Stephen? Maybe I showed the same one. That's yeah. possible. Yeah. But uh, since I have forgotten, others have forgotten. Uh, and anyway, it, it, it is about interacting. And you can see at the border between the two, you can see the white lines. That's the, the dead coral skeleton. Wow. So we started with a very, very young boy, and we end with death. <laughs> wow. That's quite dramatic. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you. That was great. Fantastic presentation. Yeah. Just a... Uh, couple more uh, comments, uh, only a few. Uh, thank you, Stephen. I learned a lot and seen a lot, Yvonne says. Thank you, Yvonne. And uh, Dagmar, our resident Canadians. <laughs> they will certainly take longer, a longer look and closer. Good. Then, then I have uh, attained what I wanted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there we will be a lot, a lot of slow diving in the future. <laughs> yes. Take... Thank you. Uh, yes, cut your cut your fins in half. That's enough. Yeah. Except except when you dive in the strong currents where we observe those barnacles. I have another uh, question from Katrin. She's asking, um, "Have you seen nudibranchs eat other nudibranchs?" And the Chromodoris apparently they eat each other. Well, that's one of those many things that I have not observed. Okay. I don't know. And uh, I, I don't know it from literature either. No, and your son with a cryptic name. Thank you, very Jan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Sonia and Albert say thank you too. Yeah, and uh, you say very interesting. So yeah, great. Uh, the time flew by. Fantastic. Thanks again. Thank you uh, again, uh, Stephen and uh, Marion. Uh, also, nice explanation. Thank you. And Marion says, uh, Dank. Graag gedaan. Okay. <laughs> oh, and look, uh, Rudy is here as well. <clears throat> ah, Rudy. And, uh, and you're Yeah. My, um, <laughs> no, it's a new side of dive. <laughs> a new side of dive, yes. Um, so, everyone, uh, uh, thanks a lot for uh, tuning in. Stephen, thank you for uh, joining. Um, before next, next presentation, live in, uh, in Lembe or Manado. Oh, I would love that. I would love so. Yeah, with a so, beamer. So would I. Uh, yeah. af af after dinner, cold beer. That would be yeah. awesome. But, but also before a dive and seeing, look, guys, yeah. we are going to look at this now. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. We can do a, we can Definitely. do a workshop. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah.
So everyone who uh, currently uh, tuning in, uh, remember next week we will not have a live stream. We will have two Zoom parties next week. Um, so please make sure you join that if you like, and uh, let's just let's just hang out together. And um, yeah, that's about it. From people. We will, we will let, you, let know. you know through the through the newsletter that will be sent out on Tuesday. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and it uh, has uh, more news in it. Big announcements coming up. And uh, everyone who joined us again, who tunes in every week, especially the guests who uh, didn't manage to come, thank you so much for your presence. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. Steven, always a pleasure having you with us. And, and indeed, next time, let's do it here. Yes. yes. Yeah. All right. No, actually, I think, Stephen, do it before you come here, because it might take some time before you can come. Yeah. So we will, I, well, I would like to well, invite you one more time or two more times. Wale, can we do that? This was number three? Four? Something three, like that. Three, yeah, maybe three. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Could you do more? Uh, I think I have enough imagination. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. It would be nice. Thank you. All right. Everyone, uh, uh, please uh, don't... For, for a while, I'll leave the floor to others, and then, uh, yes, I'll okay. come back. All right. Thank you, Stephen. And for now, I want to ask everyone, please do share this uh, with everyone you know, and uh, we will see you next week on Zoom. For now, thanks a lot, and see you all next time. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.